thank you for uh, Jen and Erin. Uh, really interesting presentations. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, discussion points there. Uh, we can just begin with a, uh, a question, a general question for both of you. Uh, which, yeah, so you can both, either, either one of you can, can start, uh, whoever wants to go first. So the question is, um, what do you think are the biggest challenges and drawbacks to the areas that you've discussed this evening? Uh, today, both for obviously great uh, degrowth and the B Corp movement. Uh, are these mainly the traditional economic approaches as discussed, or are there other cultural and political challenges too? If so, are you able to name a few? Um, so yeah, either one of you can go first. Erin, uh, do you want to go first? Or? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I'll go. Uh, so in terms of degrowth, I think it's uh, it's awareness. Um, and I say that, but it's not like we're making significant progress on reducing fossil fuels or uh, any of those things either. So I feel like um, we're not necessarily behind where we need to be, but just the whole movement needs more awareness and you know like so one of my sort of projects at the moment is social tipping points because there's not enough people who get it <laughs> or, or maybe get it but don't realize their peers get it so it's not top of mind and it, but there's a lot of um we there's so much research it's all really very fascinating but we tend to do what our peers are doing and if all our peers are going to the shops and buying a new outfit it feels very awkward to then turn up in something you bought from the op shop so you know, we it's it takes a lot of courage to be the person who will turn up in the upshop outfit. And if your mates, you know, three years still are not doing it, you might find that you just revert back to do what you're doing before. So it's really about uh, providing spaces where people can take on those new behaviors that we need to embed in society and then allowing them to proliferate out through social tipping points and networks and some of the sciences that we've that exists we have research into these things we've seen social tipping points before when it comes to uh, you know getting women the vote um ending segregation um marriage equality even the fall of the ussr is partly due to social tipping points so let's take some of those learnings and start to apply it to the environmental movement and that's part of what we're doing at rebiz right now <clears throat> So, yeah, like I, I think there's an enormous challenge, but I don't think it's specific to degrowth. I think it applies basically to the entire environmental movement. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, Erin. Um, yeah, Jane, if you wanted to go. Yeah, I, I think in, in, if I sort of break apart the B Corp, that certainly is a lot of work and, and that does cost businesses money and, and I'm not going to sugarcoat that. But the reason that... I still believe any business can do some of those initiatives, initiatives that I spoke about is because they want to and because they actually believe that that's the right thing to do. So you don't need to be a B Corp to donate to B1G1. You don't need to be a B Corp to sponsor someone through an education program. It's really, it's shifting the budgets around, I think, that that needs to happen. So we don't spend so much money on going out to chase sales through business development, perhaps, we need to put money into sustainability and then that that will actually grow. You know, your business will grow because people see that you are you are a good business. Um, you won't be spending as much through HR on recruitment because your people will be staying. So I think there's, there's some of those, you know, challenges that could be overcome if people thought differently. Right, thanks for that. Um, we have a question from uh, the attendees just written in. Um, I think we can, it probably is relevant to both of you in different ways, but um, the question is, having a, a car rented as a as it sits for 23 hours a day is a very good business proposition, uh, so it can be used by others. Uh, but, but I wonder how will that reduce carbon emissions and also will that have a ripple effect on the economy? So maybe you could try to answer that as it applies to uh, your discussion. But um, yeah, Erin, do you want to go first? Yeah. So, I mean, if if we're travelling the same number of kilometres but in one car instead of five cars, then it doesn't change carbon emissions, maybe unless it's an electric vehicle, I suppose. Not that I'm necessarily promoting electric vehicles, but um, it does mean that we're not. So I think there's, you guys might know better than me, let's say one tonne of um, steel, steel, what, what are cars made of, steel? 
I say still, um, in every car. That like I, I read this meme. It's so funny. It's like they've got two individual armchairs and then a full couch in the back seat, and then we've got you know four tires worth of rubber that goes on every car, and we replace those tires every couple of years. There's you know tons of steel in the front. There's all of these things, and every um, so every car that's produced is um it has an environmental footprint there's a huge amount of carbon emissions that just go into the process of creating cars before you even put them on the road so this idea that we can at least start sharing and then you know ideally if you're finding it a bit awkward to share you might say well let's jump on the bus you know like i don't want to wait for the x person into it like we can we can try travel differently certainly but we also don't need all the resources that we're using and and it's that was one example but do we all need um a lawnmower so the lawnmower gets used for one hour every two three or four weeks depending what time of the year it is you know potentially my entire street could exist with one lawnmower you know <laughs> like the, the, there's all these things we probably could be sharing but it's better for the companies we're buying from if we all buy one and then it sits in our garage or our shed or whatever until we use it. So just starting to think differently about what do we really need and where obviously we pay for it with money, but we mostly get that money through our time. So we're exchanging our time to own these things that we store. You know, what what, what else can we be doing with our time that we might enjoy more than working to store things that we don't use very often, I think is, you know, some really interesting thoughts that we could be having. Yeah, good points. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jenny, do you want to have a go at that question? Um, I I love the sharing economy. I I think it's something that we're going to see more of as well. I, I think back to when my two boys were, you know, three and, and six. We used to go to the toy library and we would borrow toys. Um it, and I think there's there's tool libraries starting to be developed as well, rather than everyone having, my husband bought a jackhammer one time for something to, you know, to break up some tiles. We didn't need to buy it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really think that the, the sharing economy is, is going to be big. So if we can, if, if there is infrastructure that supports us to use public transport instead of everyone having a car, let's do that. That it really does also need to have that infrastructure to support. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that. Um, we'll just move on to a couple of uh, more specific questions for each uh, speaker. So uh, for Erin, um, just in the context of GDP being a poor metric of human wellbeing, as highlighted by Robert F. Kennedy in 1968, as you mentioned, how can we effectively transition to alternative measures that more accurately reflect societal and environmental uh, health? Yeah, so the one I compared it to on one of the first few slides, genuine progress indicator, GPI, that's a that's a different metric we, we could be using. It exists already. There's sort of not a shortage of metrics we could be using. Uh, what is in short supply is us actually using those metrics. You know, there's we, uh, the Australian government took um, proposals from people on which metrics we should be using. It's like, I I know you guys are tracking poverty, but you're not doing anything about it. <laughs> so, you know, all of these metrics exist. Um, inequality, we all know what the inequality is. What is missing is trying to do something to avoid the inequality. So I think uh, most of the ecological economists would say GPI is probably basically right. It takes in the so uh, social and environmental woes. That's, that's, that's what we're looking to do. I think we're going to be better placed if we move away from having a sole metric to having a panel of metrics that we check and each are important rather than just tallying it up because that's when you start to miss bits and bobs. Um, but yeah, it's not the metric that's a problem. Uh, it's the fact that we are exceeding all of the planetary boundaries and not doing anything about it. So, yeah. All right. Thanks for that. Yeah, really. Uh important yeah really good answer there um i just uh, yeah for jen um uh the question here is how has the perception of business success evolved over the past 20 years particularly about the importance of profits versus uh, broader societal and environmental impacts i think i i don't have any stats with me that sort of demonstrate uh, the 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 statistics on that but if I were to look at the B growth, the B lab growth over the past few years, and in particular since COVID, there has been, I think they've said that they've they've now got over 8,000. I think in 2019, they were about closer to 2,000. So there's just been 
exponential growth in businesses wanting to to sort of do more and it it really does make sense that if you can if you can spend the money on looking after your stakeholders and th and that's why a lot of businesses have loyalty programs is because they want them to stay so why you know loyalty programs for your employees is actually looking after them um, loyalty programs for your community is buying from them so they stay in business as well okay i'm not sure if that's answered but um, i haven't got any stats off the top of my yeah. head <laughs> sorry no that's good yeah thanks for that um i've just uh just for Erin again actually we've got someone else one of the attendees has just posted a, a message uh, a question um you mentioned the solution was free housing and food etc but uh the person now asking concern my concern is if you give resources for free if you give resources for free many people will take more than they need do you think this could be a pitfall for giving everyone what they need for free um yeah look I think in most instances you can't take more than you need so if you provide free health care like you you don't you can't take more than you need there you just you access it when you need it sort of thing um education same thing um housing like you you wouldn't get access to more than one house so i think those things sort of work themselves out um regarding food water internet you'd provide a quota so you'd provide a quota maybe per person per household and then anything that they used over and above that then they have to pay for um so that's how you manage that and the food one's a tricky one like maybe the solution isn't free food but it's community gardens everywhere it's uh fruit trees in council verges it's um yeah I don't the food ones I haven't seen that as much anywhere actually it's just um something being floated by um people I follow who are in the degrowth movement um and that might be a tricky one to actually implement um but for the rest I feel like it's not something that you can take more of than you need um and and it, where it might be such as internet then you provide a quota Right, good point. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I just got uh, yeah for uh, Jen. Um, can you describe the main component components and requirements for B Corp certification, and how these elements transform the economic system to benefit people, communities, and the planet or, or global ecosystem? The way the B Corp system works at the moment is that there is the assessment. And you need to reach 80 points across the whole assessment. You're not penalised for not doing things, but you are given points for your positive impact. So the fact that you will get more points if you are creating programs for your community, you will receive more points if you are giving your workers more benefits, more training. That's going to that's going to make sure that everyone in the, the ecosystem benefits. Um, there is also a legal requirement at the moment. So if you're a, a business with constant, you know, your, your um, business constitution documents, you need to change those. So it's really taking it seriously to say that all of the directors will treat the stakeholders equally and we won't be putting profit before our people or before planet. So that's quite a fundamental change. Now, B-Lab are evolving their standards as well. So in 2025, those standards are going to change and there will be minimum requirements rather than an 80 point holistic view at the moment. Okay, so it is something that is, is looked at every, it's about every three years and we're going through a significant change next year. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, Jen, a uh, question for you. Um, yeah, given the correlation between uh, GDP growth and the material footprint and the uneven distribution of GDP growth, what strategies can be employed to ensure a more equi equitable distribution of wealth and resources while simult simultaneously, simultaneously so reducing our global eco ecological footprint? Sorry, was that for that Jen or for myself? No, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, that was for Erin. Uh, 
Oh, um, so, yeah, I mean, this is where you start talking about uh, increasing taxes on, you know, like, should, do we really need billionaires? What What's, <laughs> and we're not, like, it's not even just a billionaire anymore. Like, I read yesterday that the five wealthiest people in the world doubled their their wealth in the last two years. And it went, I'm going to get the numbers wrong. It went from something crazy like 200 billion to 400 billion, or it might have been even more. But, like, what are they doing with that much money when, there's it's literally half the world's population live on less than five us dollars a day and that's got um purchasing power parity incorporated into it so it's what you can live off in the us with five us dollars like it's crazy that we allow that much inequality to exist so it's wealth taxes but then it's also you change the way um uh profits from companies are distributed like you like you, taxing is difficult because you've given it to them and now you need to get it back it's it's removing that ability to take so much of the profits from everyone's labor in the first place yeah thanks for that yeah um i just yeah for jane we've just got a question um yeah how does the b corp movement align with and support the sustainable development goals of the sdgs specifically within the area of quality education, decent work and economic growth? So the, the way the, the B Corp framework works is that there is a list of questions. Um, let's talk about community, for example. So that would be education. Um, there, is, there is questions that are focused really around your business operations. And then there is the other tool called the SDG Action Manager. And that tool goes into more detail around the SDG goals and the, the targets. So you can actually be, be providing answers to show how your operations and how your business model is benefiting the stakeholders. And you can at the same time use the SDG tracker to then answer more specific questions to make sure that you're then going to answer, for example, 4.1, 4.4. 4.6 of the SDGs. So if you want to, you can go in deeper for that. All right, thanks for that. Um, we might just have time for one more question each. So I'll just uh, get on to that. So uh, yeah, for Erin, um, yeah, your talk uh, suggests that degrowth um, involves a planned and democratic reduction of in material and energy throughout in output in over-consuming nations whilst improving well-being and global justice. How can such a transition be effectively implemented at a policy level? And what are the potential challenges and opportunities uh, in, in shifting towards this model? Yeah, so there's heaps of research and um, I hope I get the opportunity to share some links because I can send them through maybe tomorrow. Um, uh, Post-growth, so that's degrowth, a-growth, post-capitalist policies are really popular um, with the general public, with climate scientists, with academics, with researchers. Um, it's not that there isn't support for them. It's the, more the fact that the people in power aren't doing what the people want to do. And um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with citizens' assemblies, but there's been a host of them through Europe, and literally they come back. Like it feels like... <laughs> They're just taking a degrowth manual and um, recommended policies that we talk about in degrowth all the time. So when everyday people have the opportunity to propose solutions, when they're fully made aware of our ecological crises, they come back with degrowth aligned policies. It's like literally like no more runways, like, uh, you know, public transport free for everyone. All of the things that we all make sense, that we all know we should be doing. And then these policy proposals from the citizens' assemblies they get stopped at the parliament level because the people in power are often responsible to their lobbyists. And um, and that's where we need to break that. That's the biggest roadblock. So again, I come back to social tipping points and trying to uh, create a movement of people who understand that oh, I don't want to, it sounds like such a downer. We're in a mass extinction event. Like it's really serious and we need to be doing more. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, and just, yeah, final question for um, uh, Jen. Um, when an organisation is recertifying as a uh, B Corp, uh, where their initial score was the baseline of 80, uh, can the organisation be, be recertified even if their score remains at 80? 
uh, the, the questioner asks, if yes, then what are the measures or incentives to encourage continuous improvement rather than uh, for a company acquiring the certification purely for publicity and uh, say brand image purposes? Question. It's, it's rare, but, and I've never heard of it, where an organisation would get just on 80 for recertification. The whole premise of, of B Corp is about continuous improvement. So every year you want to make sure that you are doing better. Of course, at the moment, the way that the scoring system works, there is the potential that a business could could get 85 in the first year and, and then still recertify three years later with 83, for example. However, I know that there would be questions asked about, well, what, what are you doing? Um, and the process does take a few months to do. So there would be things that, that you know, there, there would be constant check-ins between um, the organisation at BLAD to make sure that you are continually improving as well. Right. We yeah, won't, we won't, yeah, we won't yeah. see that though in future. What in twenty beyond twenty twenty five, we won't see that because there there are specific things that we we'll, we will need to meet in order to be certified. Cool. All right, that's great. Uh, great. Yeah, thank you very much to both of you. Yeah, we've kind of uh, gotten uh, run out of time now, so uh, there were there were further questions. These might need to be taken up uh, later, but for now, yeah, thanks once again. I'll